amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see.
Good evening. My name is Ryan Boggs, and I'm a junior on the pastor track, and I have the privilege of leading you in worship this evening. For our order of service, we'll be using page 20, Evening Chapel 3, in your chapel booklets. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, teach us your ways. You comfort and help us day by day. You are the King of heaven and earth. Lord Jesus, you invite us to pray and promise that where two or three come together in your name, there you are with us. Answer our prayers and fulfill our desires according to your wisdom and love. Strengthen us in the knowledge of your truth and grant us life everlasting. Amen. We'll now join in the hymn as led by the praise ensemble. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Practice makes perfect.
If you really put your mind to something with the right determination, you can accomplish anything. Nothing can hold you back from your dreams and aspirations. If you put in the work, what can stop you? The only thing keeping you back is yourself. With enough hard work and effort, nothing is impossible. Is this true? No. You can list off any motivational hot words you want, but that doesn't take away from the fact that mere repetition of something is not always the key to success. The author of Hebrews understood this truth and he illustrates it for us in our portion of God's word tonight. We read from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. This is the word of the Lord. That's a bit offensive to the priests, don't you think? He just went on describing how these priests would go out and perform sacrifice after sacrifice. They'd go out more than once a day and they would offer the same burnt offering over and over. And in describing these sacrifices, he points out their failure of all things. Does he not understand who he's writing this to? Does he not comprehend that he's writing this to a people who have recently converted from Judaism? If anyone was going to understand the impact of these priestly duties, it would be these Jewish converts. Yet he still describes them in this way. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. The very sacrifices he is describing in these words were commanded by God. So why does he describe them in this way? Looking back at the verses, we see the inadequacy he's emphasizing, don't we? Regardless of how many sacrifices were performed, regardless of how many hours were poured in to these sacrifices, they could not achieve the one thing that was truly needed, atonement for sins. That's not what they were for, and that's not where their value was found. Do you institute your own set of rules that you have to follow? This entire concept of Jesus' sacrifice being one time for all people of all time makes absolutely no sense to our human nature. So, as sinful humans, we want to do something about it. And as a result, how often do we downplay the power of Jesus on the cross that we just reflected on on Good Friday. We say things like, I understand, I understand that there's no longer any sacrifice for sin, but I still have to do something. I'll go to church every Sunday, I'll go to chapel twice a day just to show him that I somewhat deserve it. N not that I fully deserve it, but at least a little bit. Or, I understand that he says that there's no longer any sacrifice for sin, but he definitely can't remember all the sins that I've, that I've done. I get that he says he remembers my sin no longer, 
but he can't, he just can't forget the lying, the pride, the lust. His sacrifice was great and all, but it wasn't quite enough. I can fix it though. I'll figure it out. Our embarrassing attempts at trying to help out in our own salvation only draw us farther away from the cross. They draw us farther away from the one source that can truly grant true peace and comfort. They draw us farther away from Jesus. But brothers and sisters, earlier in this chapter, the author explains that the law is only a shadow of the things that are coming. Fulfilled through the sacrifice of our high priest, this shadow is not what is, what's important anymore. The reality is here. There's no longer a question of what's coming. He's here. And what a blessing it is to know that in contrast to these Old Testament priestly sacrifices, in contrast to these embarrassing attempts that we try to put forward, this sacrifice was different. We read in the chapter that the priests, every time, would stand up and perform what they needed to perform. They stood and stood and stood, but they were never able to rest with the comfort of knowing that they had finally done what needed to be done. So how does Christ set himself apart? The writer beautifully tells us, but when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. This work has been done, the sacrifice has been made, and our Christ does not stand. He is sitting. Through his death on the cross, our high priest achieved for us the one thing that was truly needed, atonement for sins. And now he sits as our intercessor in heaven. Brothers and sisters, we do not have the jurisdiction to decide whether or not Christ's sacrifice was sufficient. And thank God that we don't. We look internally at ourselves and we see only what the Old Testament sacrifices were able to offer. We try over and over doing the same things but are never able to truly find rest. If we continue to live this repetitive life cycle, we lose sight of the promises Jesus has given us. So instead of looking internally, we look outwardly. We look outwardly at our high priest a high priest that is so powerful, he is waiting for his enemies to be made a footstool. His enemies, sin, death, and the devil, try so hard to pull us away from this sacrifice. And by nature, we deserve to be in that footstool just as much as they do. But in grace, the same sacrifice that fulfilled all of those Old Testament sacrifices was fulfilled on behalf of us. And with this comfort, we are invited to live lives knowing that our sins are forgotten. As Micah beautifully puts it, he has hurled all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. And one sacrifice made that certain. We hear these, these sayings like practice makes perfect over and over again, but that doesn't necessarily make it true. You can pour hours and hours into something, but there's no guarantee that you're going to reap the benefits of that hard work. But as I read verse 14 again, we see that there is one high priest who does make perfect. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Christ's sacrifice is sufficient. Rejoice in that promise, brothers and sisters. Amen. And may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
we pray. Dear Lord, we marvel at the sacrifice you paid for all people of all time. Shower us with this comfort as we go and share this truth with all those who need to hear it. In your holy name, amen. And we join in Luther's evening prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. Forgive me all my sins and graciously keep me this day. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us. Amen. I saw a good number of announcements, so bear with me. Want to practice your Spanish? Come to Spanish Bible study today at 8 in the CEC. We will study John's resurrection account. Hope to see you there. Want the chance to beat Ryan Boggs' team in trivia? <laughs> Come to the CAF at 9 o'clock to test your knowledge of planes, twain, and automobiles. Tomorrow during Flex, SAC, Student Athlete Advisory Committee, is hosting a student athlete panel. This is part of Division Three Week for Athletes. Come to learn about the daily life of a student athlete, SAC, and athletics here at MLC. This will be held in the auditorium tomorrow during Flex. If you have any questions, contact SAC President Camden Solsley. Join the Film Critic Club for a philosophical discussion on Dune Part 1. Attempt singing a uh, 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 main Dune theme if you know what I'm writing about. I don't. <laughs> I have not seen it. <laughs> not going to do that. The discussion will be led by Professor Thompson in WCC 177 starting at 8 p.m. Lisan al Gaib. Take a load off and enjoy some rest at this week's Tudor Bible study on Wednesday night at 9 p.m. in the cafeteria conference room. We'll discuss the impact we get to have as messengers sent on God's mission. All are invited, even if you weren't able to attend the two sessions. That's Wednesday at 9 p.m. in the CAF conference room. Thank you to the Praise Ensemble for beautifying our worship, and God bless your evening. Is it?